Okay, the last little bit of chapter 17, plane motion of rigid bodies. And this is going to be the tail end of momentum method. So we went through impulse and momentum, linear momentum, angular momentum. There's this special case down here for impacts that we need to look at. And this involves going back to chapter 13, looking at the coefficient of restitution, velocities going into a collision, velocities coming out of a collision. And it's also going to mix in some of this R cross MV stuff, where if you take that velocity and apply it to R omega, you can see R squared M, I omega. So whether it's R cross MV or I omega, we're going to do some um, conservation of angular momentum as well as conservation of linear momentum in here. So if two objects collide and these are not particles anymore, the thing or this chapter that's different than chapter 13 is that the new velocities coming out of here, that's not the velocity for the entire object. It's just the velocity for the point of contact on that object. So hopefully that makes sense. So instead of like the entire object flying off of here, it's just this little corner of it. So if you have, I don't know, two objects, right? And different parts of these objects have different velocities. So they come into each other and boom, they collide. So there's some point there where they're colliding with one another. And when they bounce off of the collision, it's only that one little point whose velocity is gonna be controlled by these coefficient of restitution equations. And that. so you look at the velocity of this point going in and the velocity of that little point going out and then to figure out the velocities of the rest of the object, you're going to have to apply some kinematic relationships to it. So try and remember everything that you know from chapter 13 about the coefficient of restitution. So one means it completely restores itself and it bounces all the way back to what it was versus coefficient of restitution of zero. Zero is like an egg. It cracks. It's smashed. It does not bounce back to what it was. So that is, um, so here's the chapter 13 really quick again. And in this case, the entire particle would have some new velocity coming out. Okay, so you have a collision, you break your velocities into which part is in the same direction as that collision force. So that's the part of the velocity that changes versus tangent to the collision. And that part does not change. So here it comes bouncing off of the collision and you can see tangent piece before and after is the same versus the normal part. So I have MV, FDT, MV, right? There's a force in this normal direction. So the velocity in the normal direction. And here's our linear momentum equation. So we have A and B going into it. Internal forces cancel out. And then A and B, the new velocity coming out of it. Now this is just in the normal direction. Okay, so everything here in red is applying to what's happening in this red direction. In the green direction, it's the same velocity going in and out. You're not worrying about coefficient of restitution here. It's just there's no force in that direction. Okay, so this is what it was for particles. For our new chapter, rather than just a particle, this is only true for this one little piece of the object bouncing out. So hopefully that is um, clear. Um, let's see, here's a concept question. So we've got some cars, they crash into each other, and we want to know what happens. And it looks like a messy crash. So coefficient of restitution is less than one in this case. What could we say is true? Is the linear momentum of car A conserved? So if I looked at car A, M, M A V A plus force on A D T goes to M A V A after the collision. Is that conserved? Well, there's a force on A, so it's not conserved. How about the combined two car system? So if I draw my system boundary around both of the cars, is that conserved? And in that case, then my force is equal and opposite. It becomes internal to the system. And for both of the cars, then yay, it is conserved. So we can say, yes, the linear momentum of the combined two cars is conserved. Even though the coefficient of restitution is less than one, there are no external forces. And 
these collision problems, you're not thinking about like the friction between the road because you're looking at right before the collision and right after. Okay, so this happens over a very short time period. Impulse is really quick. And in that time period, you're not worried about friction between the car tires and the road. It's just the two cars crashing into each other at that point. Okay, the total kinetic energy before the impact versus the total kinetic energy after the impact. Is this conserved? What do you think? It doesn't look like the kinetic energy is conserved. So E is less than one, there's heat coming off. Energy is not conserved in this case. So energy is a whole different quantity than linear momentum. Even though MV sounds like one half MV squared, this is an example of where energy is not conserved, where linear momentum is conserved. And last one, angular momentum of the combined two cars around Q. So what is angular momentum? That's R cross MV. So if we look at our R cross MV, right? So maybe we draw from Q to the MV of B, and we have R cross MV of A, and we look at that before and after. Now, what's going to change our angular momentum? Again, some kind of external moment to the system. And if this is a collision that happens very quickly, then there's no external forces, no external moment, and our angular momentum would also be conserved, and we can use that R cross MV to solve these problems as well. Example time. So here we have two objects that are colliding into one another. One of these objects is pinned in place, and this is going to be very helpful to us in figuring out the velocity. Because remember, if something is pinned in place, that means the velocity of everything, it's like it's all rotating around this one spot. So no matter where we are, we can get the velocity of each little corner of this by just looking at r cross omega, right? V equals omega cross r. So let's go ahead and read this problem statement and think about how to solve it. So we have a really teeny little bullet here, 0.05 pound bullet, and it's going really fast, 1500 feet per second. So even though it's a little mass, it's going to have a huge impact here because of that velocity. The block is 20 pounds and it's initially at rest. So we want to know the angular velocity of the panel immediately after the bullet becomes embedded. So angular velocity. We are looking for some kind of an omega here, right? And when you think of angular velocity, you should immediately think R cross MV, V is our omega, so R cross M, R omega, R squared M omega, I omega. We're looking at the um, inertia of the plate here. And we want to know the impulsive reaction at A. So this pin at A, anywhere it touches, right, there's going to be some kind of a force here. So the bullet slamming in in one direction, so AX is probably going to be to the left. Okay, and we have a time. This becomes, this collision happens in 0 0.006 seconds. So remember, you're either going to have force through a distance in which you deal with energy like MG8, or you have force through time, which is going to be impulse momentum type calculation. So we're we're doing time here. So this is going to be R cross MV and MDT or MV and FDT. So let's go ahead and start with our R cross MV and drawing our impulse momentum diagrams. So initially, here is our MV, and then there's some external forces that are applied. So we're not drawing the force between the bullet and the plate because that is an equal and opposite pair of forces, so we don't have to worry about it. And that is the advantage of defining our system as everything together instead of just one piece of it. Okay, so this is our FDT moment DT, and our new system 
the center of gravity is moving forward and we have some kind of omega. So this is where you can either take the inertia around A in which you don't have to worry about MV or we probably don't have a table that shows us inertia around A. So we'll have to do the inertia around the center of gravity and the velocity of the center of gravity. So here we go, let's crank through some numbers here. This is R cross MV, and we're gonna do this around point A because that gets rid of all of the forces at point A in our calculation. So we're gonna go R cross MV. So remember, we're looking at the perpendicular relationships here for R cross MV. So here's our 14 over 12 feet, make sure everything is in feet. If you're gonna use like 32.2, I think it gave us some weight in pounds and we're gonna to have to change pounds to mass here. So this is our R cross MV. And for this case, because we're taking the moment and angular momentum around point A, that means we don't have to worry about these external forces at all. And at the very end, so these guys are describing this final picture here, right? So there's kind, some kind of inertia of the plate, the angular velocity of the plate, and the velocity of the center. How is the velocity of the center related to omega? Well, V is equal to R omega. So we can get everything in terms of angular velocity instead of linear velocity. Okay, so here's V equals R omega. So now we can get everything in terms of omega. We look up what the inertia of a plate is and their tables. We plug in mass and the size of our, of our plate, and we can solve for omega now. So that wasn't too, too painful, right? So you just have to remember some kinematic relationships like V equals R omega, and it does help to draw some pictures. And R cross MV, looking at angular momentum over linear momentum, this is very helpful because we didn't have to worry about these forces. Now, I think the problem statement did actually ask us to solve for that force. So now that we know omega, how could we go back and figure out what that force was? So now we can look at the linear momentum because that's gonna have FDX in it. And FDX is what gives us our change in MV. So here we go. We have our omega, we have our final velocity, we have our initial velocity. So for our conservation of linear momentum, the only thing here that we don't have is this force that is changing it. So MV plus FTT equals MV. And they gave us that delta T in seconds. So now we can solve for AX. Anything happening in the Y direction? No velocity in the Y direction. So, I mean, there's gravity happening in the Y direction but this is a huge force. So it's one of those cases where we're just gonna ignore gravity. It's a very small time step. So considering the time that it happens over that AY, just holding up gravity, there's no velocity in the ground. We're just, we're just interested in the impulse from the bullet slamming into it. So we'll say AY is zero. Okay. That is the end of chapter 17. Let me know if there's any other problems you'd like to see worked out or any other videos made, and we'll see you later.